Okay, welcome to the next video for SI-335. We're continuing our unit on sorting, and today we are going to talk about uh, something very exciting, which is a new algorithm and a new way of thinking about algorithms, um, and it's all about uh, something called merge sort. So let's take a look. The new idea here, um, and what is called an algorithm design paradigm. So there's like a way of thinking of how to design algorithms. It's something called divide and conquer. This is, I think, probably a military or like political strategy. You can think of divide and conquer as being applicable in a lot of aspects in life whenever you want to solve a big problem. The trick is to break it down into smaller problems that you know how to solve more easily and then try to build up the whole solution. In terms of thinking about computer algorithms, that's really what it means as well. So you wanna break your large problem into similar sub-problems. This is really key, similar sub-problems. Um, and it's something that makes the most sense when we're thinking about algorithms. So the idea is that when I wanna des design a divide and conquer solution, I'm, I'm like trying to figure out how to do some task, like sorting. And if we're gonna do sorting in a divide and conquer way, this means that you're going to end up sorting some smaller lists in order to sort the bigger list eventually. So it has to be similar because we're gonna do recursion to solve those sub problems. And then we combine the results. So it's kind of like split it up, um, recursively solve, and then combine them back again. Binary search is, is another algorithm we saw that worked like this. Uh, although it's a little bit less obvious how binary search fits into the solve each subproblems recursively, because in the case of binary search, you only really have one subproblem. Uh, you can think of it that in binary search, so what, what happens in binary search is I look at the middle of the list, and then I have two problems to solve, like searching on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, but one of those problems becomes trivially easy because I know that what I'm looking for is not there. So you can think of binary search as, as a divide and conquer where one of the subproblems is always trivially, the answer is just no, it's not there, and so you focus on the other one. And so a merge sort is going to follow a similar strategy of splitting the array in half, uh, but because it's sorting, it has to do something for the whole list. So the runtime and the behavior is going to be different than binary search, but this idea of um, solving a big problem by breaking it up into smaller parts and using recursion is something that we'll see over and over again in this class and it's a good strategy to use to design pretty efficient algorithms. Let's look at an example before I show you the pseudocode and work through the details of this. So what we're going to do is just make an array of a bunch of elements and then think about what it would look like to use the divide and conquer recursive strategy to sort this array. Okay, so I filled this array with random values. So we have an array of size nine that has uh, some random numbers in it. And different divide and conquer strategies work differently. And in fact, there's two very famous divide and conquer sorting strategies that work in some ways opposite. But the way the merge sort works is that the splitting up is just cutting the array straight up down the middle. So we don't do any work to split this thing up, we just cut it down the middle. Um, and I picked an array of size nine because I wanted to point out that whenever we have to cut something down the middle but it has an odd size, of course it's not gonna be exactly in the middle. And the way that I happen to write this code, it's gonna pick the smaller array for the left-hand side. But um, ultimately that doesn't really matter. And now, so this is uh, this is kind of, now we've split this up. So we have one array of size four, and then one array of size five over here. Now the second step of any divide and conquer strategy is to use recursion. And recursion means that we're going to, we have some similar sub problems now, so we have two smaller sorting problems, and we're just gonna assume that our algorithm already works to recursively sort those. And one way of thinking about this, you can think of this as like using a different sorting algorithm, like maybe you would use selection sort to do these calls. In reality, we're just gonna use merge sort itself to do the recursive calls. But we don't wanna overthink about how that recursion works at first when we're just trying to figure out the overall strategy of the algorithm. 
So we're just going to say, hey, I assume that there's, I know that there's some ways to sort these small arrays, so assume that that happens. So this becomes 8, uh, 35, 76, 95. And this one is going to start with 5, that's already in place, 11, 15, 29, and 34. Okay, so we split up the input, we did our recursion, and now step three is to combine these. This step three is the tricky step for merge sort. For some algorithms, step three is really easy. Like for binary search, step three is you found the thing you're looking for on one side, now you just return it. So there's not anything really to do here. But for merge sort, this is where the, the big task actually comes in. Um, and this is where the, the merge algorithm itself comes into play. So the way merge works is we imagine we are having kind of like a pointer, um, an arrow into each of these arrays. And then we make one big array for the output. And what we do is we consider at each step along the way, what should be the next uh, element to go into the output based on what's smaller. So Comparing the two things that my arrows are pointing to, 5 is smaller than 8. So that means that 5 is going to move down into the output. And I will move this arrow over in that array to now point over to 11. So now step 2, I'm comparing 8 and 11. 8 is smaller. So I put 8 at the next spot of the output. And I'm going to move this arrow over to the next one here. Then I just continue this process. 11 is smaller than 35. So I put 11 next and move the arrow over on the right hand side. And so far they've taken turns like 5, 8, and 11, but they don't have to always be strictly taking turns like that. Um, so now I'm comparing 15 and 35 and obviously 15 is smaller. So the next thing that's going to go in is going to be 15. And you can see that this is going to take um, actually everything from the right hand side now. So it's going to take 29 next and 34 next. So once it's taken everything from this right hand side array, now this right arrow is kind of off the end of that one, meaning that we've consumed everything in this array. It's all smaller than the next thing in the left hand side. And so now we just march through the left hand side and take each of the following things in like a final loop. So 35, uh, 76 and 95 will all get transferred at the end, kind of the leftover. So what happens is you're always comparing two things at a time until one of the arrays uh, runs out, and then you just dump the rest of the contents of the other one. And so this last part, as I said, this is called the merge algorithm. And that's really the magic that makes merge sort work. So just to summarize again, we have these three stages, and this is important to understand how merge sort works, but it's really important also to understand the strategy of divide and conquer, which is we split up our input. Usually we want to split things evenly. If we split things unevenly, it's gonna ruin the complexity. So splitting near the middle is important. Then you just apply recursion in step two to solve to sort each part. We're just assuming that works. In reality, that would be another recursive call that splits this again, and this splits this one again, and then the, splits those small ones again, um, and recombines them. And then we eventually come up with these sorted things, and we do the merge step to come up with the final result. So this is the important way to think about this, where this middle step two is just, we're just saying, hey, this is recursion. And we can also break that down a little bit more precisely, uh, if I can use my tools here effectively, um, when we want to think about how does that how does that really work? So I think I should be able to do this. Yes, uh, my my two went out of its circle. Um, so what's really happening in the middle? We shouldn't have to think about this detail at every step, but it's it's important to visualize. It's going to be important for the complexity. Is that this gets split further? So the, all this initial splitting happens without any sorting going on. Uh, so this would be 95 and 76. And this one, the way I wrote it, the smaller array always goes on the left because this is an odd size again. So we get 15, 
1134. And that splitting process continues until you get down to one element arrays. So like 33 and 8, uh, 95 and 76, all these are just one element arrays. And that's the base case of the recursion because those are already sorted. Uh, single element is always in order. Uh, but this one has to have another intermediate stage. So 15 and 11 get split up into 15 and 11. And uh, then 34 is by itself. Okay, so all of this kind of splitting up stage, that's the beginning part of this algorithm. That's like the divide part of divide and conquer until you're getting down to the base case. Depending on how you structure it, you might do all of the left-hand side first and then all of the right-hand side. That's usually how it'll work. You could also imagine doing this in parallel or something. It doesn't really matter for the, um, for the complexity of how much total work is involved. But the important thing is that eventually you get down to the base case, base cases, I should say, where everything is size one, and then you're gonna start building up. So what's that gonna look like is that these, this 33 and eight, now those are gonna to come together and be merged. So they'll end up in sort, sorted order of eight and 33. And these will come together to be in sorted order of 76 and 95 using that merge algorithm that we looked at. These ones uh, are already in order, so the, but in any case, the merging still happens to make sure that they're in order like this, and, and the same thing will happen here. So those will get eventually all combined, and then, uh, then they get eventually combined down to what you see here. So when we, when we view the full structure of the algorithm, it looks more like this, where you start with the full size at the top, then you're breaking everything down, breaking it down, breaking it down, and then you are combining up again at the bottom, at the bottom with the merge part. And in merge sort, the work all happens in this bottom half because the merge algorithm is the, is the thing that's actually comparing numbers and doing anything. The splitting up at the top is just like using array indexes, it's not really doing any, any work. Here's a pseudocode for that same strategy. Um, so this, what, what can we recognize here? There's some syntax things of, of Python. Uh, so these, these syntaxes for array um, ranges should make sense. I think they're called slices in Python. So this means the first and half. So this is kind of the splitting up of the array. Uh, this is the first half, this is the second half. And then, so you do recursive calls on each one. And then this, this syntax with a colon inside just means to overwrite the contents of A um, with the result of the merge. The merge itself looks like a long um, algorithm, but you saw that the way it works kind of makes sense logically. So this is the first stage where we're always comparing two things. And then what's happening down here is you're only gonna run one of these two while loops at the bottom. It just depends on which one ran out of numbers. So in the, and in the merge example we saw a moment ago, the right-hand side array, I guess would be C in this case, ran out of numbers before B did, which would mean that you would do this first while loop with the comparisons, and then the second while loop to get rid of the rest of the things in B, and the third while loop wouldn't actually run at all. So I'm gonna emphasize that one of these will always have um, zero iterations because one of the arrays will be um, entirely consumed by the time you get there, but that's okay. Then everything goes into this array A and that's what gets returned. So the reason I should just say, the reason why this is called merge, probably it's obvious to you, but if you've driven, then you know that if you have a highway with like two lanes and then at some point the highway might get a little bit skinnier and it goes down to one lane. Then this is the merge point right here and the cars that are driving down the highway are kind of like the numbers in these arrays and they have to decide which one of these cars is gonna go first at the merge point because there can only be one ordering coming out of it. So that's, the, that's what this algorithm is doing is, is it's kind of deciding who's gonna go first at each step. And with cars, you might decide this based on being fair or being aggressive or 
whatever ways people drive their cars. But in terms of our sorting algorithm, it's going to be based on which number is smaller. That's the one that's, that'll go next. Our next step is now to analyze this. So we have a recursive divide and conquer algorithm merge sort that depends on this subroutine merge. Merge itself is not recursive, it's just some loops, but we need to analyze this subroutine before we can analyze the whole algorithm itself. So in, in thinking about this, we really have three loops. We have this first loop where we're taking from either one, then the second loop and a third loop that are just kind of getting the leftovers from one of the two input arrays. And um, there's, there's a couple of different ways we can think about this analysis. But I want to point out that it's a good example of where uh, just treating each while loop separately, we can't kind of finish things off. So take a second to think about what these while loops would cost. And if you do that, you'll see that this is what it is. So uh, we have our three loops. The first loop goes at least min of the two sizes times and at most the sum of them. And what does that mean? Is that so this while loop has to go long enough for either i to reach the end or j to reach the end. So each reach the end of b or c. But depending on how they are, maybe all of the things in b are smaller than all the things in c. In that case, it's just going to go through the array b here. So the cost of this would be b steps only, um, and, and then no more. But maybe they're all like intertwined, like taking turns every time, and then this while loop would end up going like b plus c times. So the the cost of this first loop could be as small as um, a or b, whichever is smaller, but it could be as, as large as the sum. And then the second and third loops at the end, well, those could be as large as the size of those arrays. Um, like if we have to dump the whole thing out, but we said that one of those loops is going to not have any iteration. So the smallest it could be a zero. So if these are all these are tight upper and lower bounds on the separate costs of the loops. So I haven't been lazy or loose in saying how many iterations through each of these loops. But the problem is that when we analyze the loops separately, what we come out at, at the end is either min of a and b or two times a plus b. Those are not the same complexity. Um, for example, if A is really small, if we have one really small array and one really big one, um, this is a lot smaller than this running time. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a small example, but I think an interesting one where we have to actually think about how the loops interact with each other in order to do the analysis. And one way we can do that is just think about uh, sometimes you, you benefit from just like writing down a variable. So in this case, I think we can just assign a name to like what are the values of i and j at this point. So at this point, after the first while loop, we'll say i equals i0 and j equals j0. So these are just the values of i and j at the end of that initial while loop. And that allows us to now, just by having names for those variables, we can say exactly what the cost is. So how many times through this first while loop? Well it's going to be i0 plus j0, because each of these indicates one iteration through this loop. Notice that i and j each get increased by one, or sorry, one of them gets increased by one every time through here. So the number of iterations in the first loop is, is i0 plus j0. Now, how many times through this while loop? Well, this while loop is just taking the index i from wherever it is, from i0, to the end of array b. So the exact number of iterations here is exactly b minus i0. It's whatever was left in the size of array b, um, not counting the progress we made in the first step. And similarly down here, what's going to happen is j is going to march from wherever it is, from j0 up to the end of array c. So the exact number of iterations here is going to be c minus j0. And now if we add that up, and I'll put it in this table here. So if we have i0 plus j0, and then this was a minus i0, and this was b minus j0. When you add those up, the i0s and the j0s cancel out, and you just get exactly a plus b. So it probably wasn't hard to figure out. There's other ways that you could see that why that's true. Um, one simple way to see why that's 
true is just because every time through any of these while loops, you add one more thing to the output. You add one more thing to the output array A, and you know the size of the output array A is going to be the sum of the two input arrays. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's the total uh, number of iterations through all those loops, and it's more like the upper bound here. So in other words, the cost of merge is big O of the size of the two input, sorry, I should say big theta of the ties, size of the two input arrays. And now that we understand how much merge costs, now finally we can analyze merge sort. So let's think about merge sort. We have a base case, we're gonna have a recurrence the recurrence is it doesn't take really any effort. It's really cost zero when n, I guess we should say cost one because you have to check what is the value of n. Um, but when n is less than or equal to one, then the array is already sorted, there's nothing to do. Otherwise it gets more interesting. So what do you have to do in merge sort? Let's just remind ourselves. We split the array up this might cost big O of n, uh, but it might be free depending on how your programming language works. So we'll think about that in a second. There's two recursive calls, both on half of the size, and then there's this merge algorithm at the end. So we want to think about what each of these things is. So like this step costs one. These steps here cost maybe n, maybe one. Um, it kind of depends on the programming language. These are two recursive calls. So these cost two times T of N over two. And this last line is merge. We said this is gonna cost the sum of these two sides. Well, we know these are two, these are both N over two size arrays. So the total cost of this last step is gonna be one. And that's nice because we have an N here. That means that we don't care whether this is N or one. The total recurrence, when we add all this up, so you know, if you have a programming language that allows you to split the array quickly, then this would come out to be like two plus n plus two t of n over two. Or if your programming language doesn't allow you to do that and you have to like copy these arrays, then it would end up being one plus two n plus two t of n over two. And either way it works, it doesn't actually matter because both of these are and again, we can't use these simplifications with the recursion part, but with the kind of extra cost part, these are both big theta of n. So we can just replace these with n when we're analyzing this recurrence. So the extra work that we have to do besides the recursive calls is always gonna be big theta of n time because that's what the merge part costs. So whether or not it's fast to split up the arrays doesn't ultimately make a difference in the running time of this algorithm. Okay, so let's fill in this picture now. We get uh, n plus 2t of n over 2 here. This is when n is greater than or equal to 2. And now let's try to expand this out. So that's what we start with. And now we want to replace t of n over 2 with the same part. So we're going to follow the same rules that we've been doing for analyzing recurrences. What is T of n over 2? It's n over 2, right? Because I'm taking this formula and everywhere I see n, I'm replacing with n over 2. So it's n over 2 plus 2 times T of n over 2 divided by 2. And that simplifies to just n plus 2 times n over 2 is another n plus this is going to be 4 t of an n over 2 divided by 2 is n over 4. And now you might start to see what the pattern is. If we do this another step, you can do the full expansion and you'll come up with this 8 t of n over 8. Um, and so in general, we have some number of n's, I'll say k n, how many ever steps of the um, algorithm we want to trace down, plus what's this value? This is 2 to the k, it's doubling every time, times t of n divided by 2 to the k. 
and you can recognize that it's the same eight here as in the denominator, four and four, two and two. Okay, so now we have our general formula and we wanna know how large does K need to be for this to get into a base case? Well, you should recognize this by now. It's dividing the N by two every time. So that means we're gonna have log N steps. So when K equals log base two of N, then two to the K equals N and this, is, this will become one. So then this all becomes um, n times log n. So that's k times n plus 2 to the k. So what's 2 to the log base 2 of n is just n. And then t of, this would be n divided by 2 to the k, which is n divided by n, which is 1. So we have n log n plus n. So that's going to be big theta of n log n. You should recognize this is the same running time as heap sort algorithm that you learned about in data structures last year, but the algorithm works totally differently. So heap sort is, is based on building up this data structure and you kind of have to do a lot of work to build it and to break it down. I think one of the things that's interesting about merge sort is that it's, uh, you don't have to do any work in that first step of splitting things up. It's really all the work is in the combining at the end. And this is one of the reasons why merge sort in practice is one of the fastest sorting algorithms and in some form, and we can talk about the details of what form, but in some form it is used in not all, but in, in uh, many fast sorting routines that might come with your favorite um, operating system or programming language. So just in summary, we've seen a new way of thinking about designing um, fast algorithms, which is divide and conquer. We saw how merge sort specifically works. We analyzed the merge subroutine. Then we analyzed the merge sort um, overall recursive function that uses that subroutine. And what we get is an n log n algorithm faster than insertion sort, faster than selection sort, the fastest sorting algorithm we've seen so far in this class. And it's also one of the simplest and most elegant. So we'll spend a little bit more time thinking about this and what that means um, in the next couple of days. Thanks for watching.